Uh, hello. It's fun to be here after uh, Scala Day, my first conference, Scala conference. Um, I hope you don't mind. I used, I like the Scala Day slide, so I mapped it to be a type level Scala. There was no mutation, it's just object composition. Um, so, a little about me. As I said, I'm a PhD student, and I'm uh, using Scala uh, mainly as a DSL uh, f uh, to create a DSL uh, engine to create a data flow hardware description language. Uh, if somebody is interested, next month there will be a release, so you can come to me and ask questions. Uh, I'm, a uh, I'm a contributor to this ecosystem, mostly to Signaton Ops. And I like, really like to watch SIP meetings, by the way. Uh, so overview, we will, uh, will start with my motivation to help uh, promote Singleton Ops and uh, introduce, uh, then we introduce the new literal types that were added in Scala 2.13. Uh, we, we continue on to introduce the Singleton Ops library and uh, its features two-face and checked values. And I'll give a few, uh, a few seconds talk about the Scala 3 situation with Singleton Ops. And then we conclude. Okay, this is the motivation example. Those who don't know what hardware description <coughs> language is, it's uh, you describe what's, how to construct hardware, and hardware has bit accurate types. So let's take an example for a fixed size vector, like a, an arithmetic vector you use in math. And it has, we don't care about the back end elements. It has a, a size, a fixed size, and we want to be able to concat two, element, two vectors together. And we want to select parts of, part of the vector to create a, a, a new sub vector from that. So far, so good, that's what we want, but we want everything to be constrained properly. So we want the uh, selection uh, of the bounds to be checked, and we want the, when we create a fixed size vector, uh, we cannot create something with zero uh, elements or less. So this is the first trivial attempt. Uh, we add the required states when we're, we're required. Um, by the way, for an example, why can we can't drop new completely in, in Dadi is because we need to separate where we call an unchecked and, a ch and checked and unchecked uh, creation of this, uh, the, uh, this uh, class. So this is uh, very simple, but you know, one time only, very unsafe. We don't like that. So let's, uh, we're all here uh, to discuss singleton ops library. We are on our way to that. And we first get to use uh, literal types. Uh, literal types were added uh, in, by, in C, by C23. It was also uh, earlier added uh, as a demonstration in the type level Scala by Miles Saban. And under the hood, literal has changed. Most probably the ability to say type one equals, actually give it one, instead of going through shapeless and doing this. Um, so and every type is uh, supported, uh, every primitive type is supported for that. And it has, uh, the SIP also adds two other related constructs, the, oh, sorry, the singleton upper bound, so it will prevent the default widening uh, mechanism in Scala. And um, uh, it also has a way to fetch the value from a type the way witness uh, was used. So with this, you don't really need shapeless witness. So let's examine some, uh, some things. First, what is, happens if I, for the first statement, var1 equals the one literal? Uh, we get a one within the type Int, the wide type int, because we get an automatic widening. To prevent that, we can either force it with a literal type, so we force the narrow type one, or we can uh, say it's final. Uh, the REPL says it's int 
brackets one, but it's the same as the, what the first the statement above it. And we can also force uh, uh, widening uh, in, ca in case of uh, the final one. Will the next statement compile? How many think it won't compile? How many think it will compile? OK, the next statement won't compile because we have type mismatch of uh, constant types. Now, uh, the next statement does compile because there's uh, one a dot type is still type one, uh, constant type one, so it also will compile. Uh, however, the next one does not compile. Why? Because one a uh, is, is actually essentially an int, so it does not uh, compile when we try uh, to force uh, uh, and, and wide int into a narrow, uh, in this case, one literal. Will the next one, next statement compile? How many think it will compile? Okay. So indeed it does compile because basic constants operations are an inline and uh, yield constant types. Will the next statement compile? Who thinks it will compile? What will be the error message for the next statement? It doesn't know what type minus is. Okay, so something that for someone who doesn't know Scala at all uh, looks at it and says, maybe that makes sense, but no, it does not make sense if you know what you're doing. Uh, but we want it to make sense with singleton ops somehow, some magical way. Okay, will the next statement compile? How many think it will compile? Okay, it does compile actually. Yes, surprise. Uh, the, uh, there is no actual conversion here because if we look at the next one, uh, the next statement, uh, the, we force it to indeed to be one uh, lo uh, long, but. Uh, this behavior is the same in Scala, all the versions, and Dottie. I have no idea why it exists, but it does. It's worth knowing when you experiment that there is a pitfall here. Of course, the next uh, statement uh, it does not inline, so we get uh, the too long is uh, converted to long. As well, if we want to make a max of two variables, uh, the statement uh, also does not inline. And that's important because we want to do some more basic operations uh, to be able to constrain some things, and we want to be able to uh, inline them as well. So uh, how does the singleton upper bound work? So it forces the narrowing when applied to an argument. And when we use narrow on one, we actually get one. Uh, when we use the wide, we get an int. Okay, so the, we must use the single upper bound to make sure that the Scala doesn't wind our arguments. Sadly, the next statement, like the first one, also compiles. Again, this is some weird behavior. I do not know why. Okay, uh, this is an example how it, the value of is used like shapeless uh, witness. So we have our little, little types, and we want to compile them. And we want to use them for compile time uh, safety. And uh, so we have uh, now, instead of an int, we want to say, OK, size is int uh, with sing singleton. And the concatenation is also with an argument uh, with singleton. But something we don't know what to do. We need somehow to set the type of the output, which should be the addition of S1 and S and S, S and S2. How do we do that? We I won't even get started on how we are supposed to get to do the selection and all the constraints and checks to do them at compile time, which is supposed to be possible because that information is available. And 
uh, here we still are forced to create some uh, uh, runtime uh, check because we still have no way of has describing a mechanism to constrain it in uh, compile time, other than we are re the refined library. So we cannot help get we cannot work without some special help. So we need some special help. Um, so I will say, uh, before I introduce anything that enough, some of the features you will say, oh, this can be done with shapeless, or this can be done with refined indeed. Uh, but we will show something that is a, a wider concept. So essentially, the features of singleton ops is to expand the default compiler inlining in the non-trivial cases like max of two elements, uh, two values. Uh, work around the Scala C's in eager widening. Uh, we want to support various type operations, not really exist type operations, but type operations. We want to support any composition of type operations to create type expressions. Again, everything is not really type expressions, but we'll see. Uh, we want to support all the basic types, uh, also interact with net and symbols that before I knew symbols were deprecated, and that will be deprecated in signal ops as well. And uh, we want to simulate type expression compile time equivalency, like the statement that wasn't supposed to compile earlier. And we want to be able to compile, to uh, safely check uh, compile time constraints, and if uh, we don't have that information, then fall back to runtime checks. So how to use things and ops? This is the slide here for the next generations when they see it. Uh, we have two large inputs for singleton ops, either the singleton ops library and the addition of the two-face and checked uh, namespaces. Well, a basic type operation is a trait that has an out a type and the value with that uh, with a type out. And we, using uh, the magic of white box macros, we're supposed to fill those uh, two to create the magic for the specific operation. The real mechanism is a bit more complicated because we need actually, for every type of out we have, we need uh, a type of out, <laughs> a different type of, out of upper bound, so we can assign them to future upper bound that's I rely on that uh, upper bound as, a, and, uh, as a, a constraint in the type argument. And we have actually an, a large macro that handles most of everything. So it has the operand, uh, the op name, and it uh, receives up to three parameters. And these parameters can be, again, a composition of the op macro, again, again, it, and the macro traverses the tree and, um, and calculates the, the out result of all the operations. So an example, the alias plus is the op macro plus with the two arguments. And uh, the type uh, alias of a required message sim uh, does something similar. So let's take an example. Uh, we, have, we want to do an average of three arguments, A, B, C. And we want to, compile a, to create a compiled time calculation of it. Uh, so we provide an implicit calc, A plus B plus C. Of course, we have the singleton ops imported. And that's it, OK? The, so when we uh, run the argument, we get, in this case, a constant 6. But what happens if we do a refeed uh, a long? So in case of, um, in case of values, uh, we can do, in fact, one long plus 5 plus 12, and the result will be a, a long result. Uh, it, it was the behavior in singleton ops a few versions ago, but to be more strict in, in case of types, I removed it. So it does not support, so and the error is given. Um, 
And what happens if we have a non-literal type present? So single net ops can do the calculations, but at first it will throw you, no, 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 no. Give me accept non-literal result. So when we do that, the, uh, the actual result is uh, six, but the return, uh, the value will be six, but uh, the return will be wide int. So Singleton Ops supports various type operations, uh, plus, minus, and so on, comparisons, uh, logic operations, if then else logic, uh, various math and constants, uh, conversion operations, and type checks, and uh, string, some subset of string operations. All of those, again, at compile time, uh, will be reduced to just uh, constant. It also supports some special type operations that, that we've seen earlier, like they accept non-net literal. And the question if is, is it non-literal for various uses? Also, it supports a require a statement for con to create constraints. So we can just require a condition and a generic message will uh, pop out or we can use, uh, actually give a message. Uh, we will see an example uh, later. And in case that uh, this constraint is some kind of an implicit argument as, a, as fed when we want to in, uh, summon some implicit of a, a, a trait, the, uh, so we can relay that, uh, this message into the, uh, sat, the implicit not found notation of that trait. So this helps to keep the error messages uh, not cryptic. So now we have singleton ops as a, uh, to help us. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a few changes just to reduce some, uh, some things. So instead of int with singleton, singleton ops also has an alias. So we call an x int and so on, x char, x string. And here we have the operation, and we also add something called a safe int because we want the, the out of it to be, uh, uh, we want to make sure it uh, is an int, so this makes sure that we use out, it's the out which is an int, and it's constant and so on. Um, here we have the requirement, okay, the, the constraints. So we, the condition is uh, this, the size will be larger than zero, the positive, and we composed our error messages. So the error message that we had in at runtime, now we can have it in uh, compile time. So we have you, we don't have type uh, string interpolation, so we're forced to use the plus two string like the old days. But hey, at least it's something. And that's about it for compile time. So if we run a few examples, uh, we create a vec of one, a vec of two, and they're created with the one and two, uh, as a one and two types. And if we try to uh, create a vector with zero, we get in the compile time error size must be positive, found zero. Uh, we can compile the vectors and we actually get this dot out, but as uh, the repo says, but if we check actually what the, uh, L, what the type of uh, is returned is actually three, so it's correct, and it's also we can contact, concat uh, three vectors of one, again, the result is three, uh, so everything works out well, uh, but if we try to uh, just have a runtime value one, then it says, the signature now says, we cannot extract value from some large message that we don't really care about because it's not known in compile time. So at the one hand, we had compile time, uh, uh, runtime uh, uh, checks, everything worked, but it was uh, very unsafe. Now we have everything safe, but we cannot still use runtime as a fallback. So, we want to do something else. Two-faced for the help. So 
Uh, Two-phase values are named like that because one side is types and the other side is terms. So, of course, type is the prettiest side. And uh, two-phase values are not something that complicated. They're actually value classes. We're dedicated to get the best effort inlining we can have. So, and we made them so they're uh, drop-in replacements for the counter uh, uh, primitive. So two-phase int, if you place it everywhere an int is placed, in, uh, it should work in most cases. And, but it should provide the inlining capability if it's present. If not, there is a fallback of runtime like the, the, the primitive would have worked as, uh, as well. So uh, two uh, two-phase classes have a single type argument for the compile type. And that's so uh, it, ha it can be tagged like uh, a one will be uh, that one. But if we had a runtime one, that, that t will be the int. And we will see now an example. So a two-phase vector of a const literal one gives us uh, an int in the t position. However, a runtime one will give us uh, and the, the wide uh, int primitive in the t position. The, uh, both are, but we have the runtime value. So both can be used in runtime, but only one can be used with other compile time uh, knowledge uh, ta uh, uh, tags to calculate the compile time uh, values. And what's important is that if we have the compile time calculation, then the runtime calculation doesn't occur at all. So the inlining is, is there is truly inlining. And we have examples. If we have a two phase of one plus two phase of one, we get a two phase of two, again, constant. But if one of the arguments in the plus operation or in any operation is a non-literal, then, of course, we get a non-literal res uh, result at the tag, but we still have the runtime value. We can also have uh, the two-phase value with a literal, and it will produce a literal result. So under the hood of two-phase, there's what's called that we use a, an implicit two-phase dot shell. Uh, a shell, is, it says, okay, I have an operation. I have, a, I know what the calculation is. Like, if then, if then else is, it, now it's a shell of three arguments. So I, I give the type argument and what's the y type of it. So uh, I have uh, the if is Boolean and the true statement is int and the else statement is int. So I have an if then else statement of uh, int. And um, and with this uh, with and this we had to do for all the equivalent uh, va uh, capabilities of two phase. So without uh, um, so this shell is how we are going to do our operation in the uh, size vector. We can the fixed size vector. So we, here we have a shell of two, the plus operation, an argument s, the y is int, an argument s2, and the y is int. And we feed it the two values that it uses, the size and that size. Because the shell only says, OK, what, the, what, the, uh, what operation should exist? It, so it creates uh, the, a placement to have, uh, we, so we can add arguments uh, at, at these positions. So that type, this uh, type argument, uh, this, uh, this type expression is moved on to be a uh, term expression. I don't yet show what's going on with the selection. However, two-phase shell is not really necessary here. Okay? In this case, usually you're, you know that if, we, if you have implicits and you don't uh, leak them all the way to the call site, not, something won't work. But here, in this case, ev everything will work. But what happens that will leak into the call side that the uh, type uh, will be 1 plus 2, plus meaning the, uh, the plus macro operation that we described. 
Of course, it would be very, very ugly because, uh, in the repo because the Scala C is, uh, is uh, unaliasing the alias, so it's, it can become a really large, uh, uh, a really large string. But uh, again, usually you can use the, the shell and it's, it's really fine. So the two-phase term expression here becomes a type expression at the, at the output if we don't use the shell. So now we can have checked values. Checked values are two-phase values with constraints. The constraints are checked at compile time if possible. If not possible, then there is a runtime check that we can call. And that runtime check is, uh, will lead to an exception. So how it looks, let's implement this, the size check. So we have, we extend uh, here without any parameter, so it's a checked zero parameter. We just have the, the size, which must say it's bigger than zero, again, and the message that we have. What's different than we had previously than we showed, when I showed this, is now we, uh, this state, everything here, Checks both runtime and comp uh, both compile time and runtime as a fallback. So uh, this is the we use size jar checked, and this is the argument that we get. And if we wish to call the unsafe check as the fallback, we just call it. So with the new size vector we'll just call che check size unsafe checked, and this returns the size which is che which is checked both at compile time and runtime. Um, okay, so this is the largest uh, uh, code that we have, <laughs> and if to create the selection check, so the selection check, I remind you, we need to have three checks, or even more, but depends on, we each, uh, each index should be checked against the bounds of the, uh, of the size, the current uh, size. So this looks. This is the uh, this is the index bound check. So we have an index and the size, uh, which is in scope, and that's what we uh, and that's what we check. This uh, and this can be done again. That this type is used for both the start index and the end index. So you have the compile time string check, and uh, for both. Uh, for both indexes. Uh, what we have also is this, a check between the bounds. And the check between the bounds needs to, be, to happen at the implicit, because uh, there is no, informi no information yet within this uh, we, here that we know both, uh, both values, what their type, types actually ha are. So we need uh, to wait for the next block of the statement to check both, uh, uh, both arguments against one another. But again, and this one is done like similarly to, to two-face. Uh, this done is as a check shell. So now we have, we use the check shell providing the end argument and the start argument, and both of them should be uh, checked against the size which is fed externally, uh, which is known externally. And we, uh, here we create the fixed size vector after all the checks, and we have the relative size uh, calculation here. So we have a calculation, which should be the end index minus the start index plus one, and this is, and we add the two-phase shell alias here to be smaller, and this is how everything is done at both compile time and write time as a fallback, both the constraints checking and the calculation. Uh, yes? Uh, shouldn't, the, shouldn't the M be strictly larger than the scar? The what? Yeah, e, shouldn't E be strictly larger than S at, at the top? Uh, Do you allow them to be equal? Why, the, why they should be uh, strictly larger? No, this, the, the bounds where you can have, the index starts from zero to, to S minus one. Yes. 
So we are close to end and the questions later. Uh, so again, few pitfalls. Uh, infix type precedence is misleading in Scala 2. It doesn't work like the way you think it should, so there's a SIP for that. It works well in Dotty. Uh, missing unary types, if you think about using unary types that don't exist, if you like it, say something, but maybe this step won't happen, the second one. And if you use two face values on the right hand side of a comparison side, like you probably know, uh, comparison won't work the way you think because it's embedded in the any trait. But there is a proposal to implement the universal in inequality uh, with accession methods, so that won't be a problem in the future if it's accept accepted. Onwards to, to Scala 3. Um, for single dot ops, we, can we need to remove the simple support. We can use opaque types plus extension methods to implement uh, two phase uh, values instead of uh, the value classes. We can generalize instead of having a well, we can generalize, instead of having uh, zero arguments, one argument, and so on, so on, we can use any kind uh, with some macro magic. Uh, we can use inline post-tasty reflection to replace macro uh, paradise implementation, but still we don't know if still every feature can be supported. And we can use union types for upper bounds, so we can finally have either an op or an int as the upper bound. Conclusion. Ah, but the question is, for, for Scala 3, do we lean, lean singleton ops? Maybe those are features that should be somehow easily available in the language itself. Conclusion, singleton ops lets you treat types more like terms and, in fact, uh, derives the one from another and vice versa. Uh, Two-Face is your friendly neighbor neighborhood inliner, hopefully, will be sometimes within the Dotty compiler itself. And the future of Dotty looks bright. I wish to thank uh, Miles and Frank and Paul Phillips, because of them, without them, this wouldn't exist, and the other contributors of Singleton Ops, and my work has been sponsored by the Horizon 2020 Legato project. Thank you all for listening. Okay, any questions? Or is everybody waiting to get to the coffee? Coffee. <laughs> okay, I, I suppose then uh, you can ask questions over coffee and cake, which has just arrived, and we will meet again at uh, 4.40.